Hello, welcome back to our Bible study, The Grand Narrative of the Bible. In this Bible study, we are examining the story of sin and salvation, where Jesus Christ is at the center of it all, and it culminates in His death and glorious resurrection. Our Bible translation that we prefer to use at Salem Church is the English Standard Version, and that will be the translation that I'll be using today as we look a little bit at Ezekiel chapter 36 and 37. And we're also using uh, this book, How to Read the Bible for All It's Worth, by Gordon Fee and Douglas Stewart. We're in the 10th chapter here, and we're talking about prophets and prophetic literature in the Old Testament. So as is our want, and as we begin each Bible study, we will pray the collect written by Thomas Cramner, the Archbishop of Canterbury, during the time of the Reformation. Uh, so let us pray. Blessed Lord, who has caused all holy scriptures to be written for our learning. Grant that we may in such wise hear them, read, mark, learn, and inwardly digest them, that by patience and comfort of thy holy word, we may embrace and ever hold fast the blessed hope of everlasting life, which thou hast given us in our Savior Jesus Christ, who liveth and reigneth with thee in the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. Amen. I'm glad you're with us today. Uh, we want to talk a little bit about uh, prophets as poets. I have to confess that uh, I'm not a, a, a great reader of poetry. Um, my poetry is very much limited to uh, what I read a little bit in college. And it was there that I read uh, some of the war poetry of uh, the Great War, World War I. Um, it was very meaningful for me. Um, we don't often think of prophets as poets. Uh, we think of prophets like Jeremiah, who's, who's this uh, manly preacher who is thrown into cisterns and, and is beaten and, and continues to preach the word forcefully and, and boldly. When uh, we think of poets, we often think of uh, gentle, sensitive folks. And, and, um, and maybe that is the case with some of the prophets. Um, but we have to remember that poetry, um, one of the things that poetry does for us is that it is a memory tool. Uh, poetry has a certain pattern to it, the way it's written. And in that pattern of words, uh, we're able to memorize. And this was important for God's people, the Israelites, uh, a long time ago when private ownership of documents was rare. I mean, it was a rare thing for a synagogue to have a scroll of, of uh, Scripture. We know in the Gospels that Jesus comes to the synagogue and they un roll the scroll of Isaiah and he reads from it. Um, but those were very large objects. So it's not like you could carry one around in your pocket. Uh, and more often than not, people didn't have this in their homes. And a lot of people were not able to read. Uh, this is one of the reasons why in Jesus's time, the, the scribes and the Pharisees were, were so popular and important um, and influential because they were able to read and study the word. Uh, so uh, poetry was a way for the prophets to uh, get the word out and for people to memorize it, to people, for people to internalize it. Um, all of the prophets, all of the prophetic books of the Old Testament uh, contain some bit of poetry. Um, and some, as uh, Fee and Stewart point out, are exclusively poetic. Um, and one of the things that I can think about in my own experience in reading poetry which is very limited, as I mentioned, mostly just in college. Um, but in reading the war poetry of World War I, um, poetry works through our intellect by coming to us through the heart. Um, there is sense, there's a, a sensitivity to it. There is a feeling, emotive nature to poetry that enters through the heart and then uh, we're able to think through the concepts and thoughts of the writer. And, and that's one of the, the hallmarks of poetry is that um, there is a motive language used. And there is, of course, a pattern that is used. Um, the vocabulary of poetry, as Fee and Stewart point out, is purposely metaphorical. Um, a metaphor is a, a figure of speech that um, directly refers to one thing uh, by mentioning another. It's a rhetorical effect that uh, you, you talk about one thing in order to point to a greater idea, perhaps. Um, and 
one of the things that Fee and Stewart warn us about, and I think this is important um, when we're looking at prophetic literature, is to beware of, and we've talked about this from the start of this Bible study, beware of finding special meanings to, to things. Um, we're always treading in dangerous territory when we um, think that we have stumbled upon some sort of new and special meaning that someone hasn't picked up in 4,000 years of study. Um, uh, not only uh, is that um, uh, a bit kind of uh, historically chauvinistic, uh, thinking that you know better than, than all of the s scholars before you, um, uh, but uh, it's the, there's, a, there's a sense of hubris to that, right? That um, um, it's just kind of this, uh, uh, this egotistical uh, thing that one does by saying, well, I know better than the scriptures, and, and I found this special meaning that no one else has ever encountered before. So beware of that. Be careful of that. Um, one of the things that uh, Fee and Stewart point out when you're reading prophetic literature, and this is important, is to, to go slow. And then to use the tools that you have. Uh, because prophetic literature, as we mentioned last week, uh, is often difficult to work through. Um, there are all sorts of meanings that are being conveyed and uh, we want to use our tools, so we want to use our dictionaries, we want to use our encyclopedias, we want to use um, a trusted commentary, uh, if we can, when we're doing this kind of study. And, and as I mentioned, those things are all kind of expensive. Um, so one of the things that I would mention to you is uh, consider getting a study Bible. Uh, the one that I recommend is the Lutheran Study Bible put out by Concordia Publishing House. I use it myself. Uh, you have all of those tools uh, brought into one volume there, and uh, moreover, it has a Lutheran emphasis, which is important for us. Um, another edition that I would recommend is the English Standard Version Study Bible, um, put out, I believe, by Crossway Publishers, uh, and that, again, has all kinds of maps and tools that you can use in studying the prophetic literature of the Old Testament, as well as the rest of the entire Bible. So let's turn to Ezekiel chapter 36 and 37, the two assigned chapters of our grand narrative of the Bible, Bible study. Um, chapter 36 is generally read in the church's lectionary uh, during the season of Easter. The lectionary is the assigned readings the church reads at the divine service, Sunday in and Sunday out. Uh, and chapter 37 is generally read in the church's lectionary uh, on or around Pentecost Sunday. So let's get into chapter 36 here briefly. Uh, verses 1 to 15, uh, God is promising through the prophet Ezekiel um, to return his people back to the land originally promised to Abraham. Uh, in this verses 1 through 15, we can also see parallels to the Christian life. For example, um, we were conceived and born in sin, as Psalm 51 tells us, and in this way we were exiled from God. Um, we were exiled by our sin from uh, God. We were enemies of God. But by the blood of Christ and in his glorious resurrection, we've been brought back to God's kingdom. We have been made subjects of God's sovereignty uh, through the blood of the Lamb. Uh, and so we can kind of see how God is promising to bring his people back to the land promised to Abraham. But then also, if we're talking about the landscape, uh, we see in the foreground, God promises to his people then that they shall return to the land promised uh, to Abraham. But deeper into the landscape, we see that this is also a story about us. It's a story of God bringing his people from exile back to home. The story of the prodigal son, if you will. Uh, that is us, brought back to God's sovereign realm through the blood of Jesus and his glorious resurrection. We also have in verse 9 here this gospel language that God is using in this, um, this first part of the chapter of 30, chapter 36 of Ezekiel. Verse 9, For behold, I am for you, and I will turn to you, and you shall be tilled and sown. Um, this is gospel language. I am for you. Think of how Jesus speaks. This is my body given for you. This is my blood shed for you. For you. The gospel is always for you, done for you in Jesus Christ. And so here we already have in old, the Old Testament this kind of good news language that God is for us. 
If we move ahead a little bit here in chapter 36 of Ezekiel, let's look at verse 16 here. In verse 16, we have what is very common with prophets, and we've talked of this before. Um, and let's call this the uh, prophetic pre preface. The prophetic preface. There may be a technical term for it, but I'm just going to use my own term. The prophetic preface. Um, the word of the Lord came to me, Ezekiel writes. So how do we know we're reading the prophets? Well, we see stuff like that. The word of the Lord came to me. Thus saith the Lord. This is... Um, Prophetic, you know you're reading a prophet. You know you're reading prophetic literature in the Old Testament when that happens. And then as we move further down uh, to uh, uh, verse 21 of uh, Ezekiel chapter 36, uh, but I had concern for my holy name, which the house of Israel had profaned among the nations to which they came. God is concerned about his holy name. Um, uh, we think of the second commandment, right? Um, we can think of the first petition of the Lord's Prayer, uh, Hallowed be thy name. Um, God is concerned uh, that when he puts his name on a group of people, such as the Israelites, that they live in accord with that name that's been placed on them. Um, we talk about the, the word orthopraxy, right? Uh, the straight way, the straight practice, that that we are walking in the ways of the Lord. That's righteousness. That, um, that righteousness has been placed upon us as Christians. Um, but here in Ezekiel, God is trying to call them back to his ways, um, call them back to their heritage as God's people with God's name spoken over them. So think of the first petition of the Lord's Prayer from our small catechism. Hallowed be thy name. Well, what does that mean? God's name is certainly holy in itself, it says. But we pray in this petition that it may be kept holy among us also. Well, what is, how is God's name kept holy, the small catechism asks? God's name is kept holy when the word of God is taught in its truth and purity, and we, as the children of God, also lead holy lives according to it. And there you see that concern all the way back in Ezekiel. That concern is and remains to us, for us, to this day. Help us to do this, dear Father, the small catechism says. But anyone who teaches or lives contrary to God's word profanes the name of God among us. Protect us from this, Heavenly Father. Um, we as Christians have had the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, uh, spoken over us in holy baptism. Uh, we have this new identity put upon us in baptism where we have died with Christ and have been raised with him. Uh, and so we want to live lives according to God's word then, don't we? We want to have his word in our ears and upon our eyes. That's why we're studying the Bible. We want to know what God's word is for us in law and gospel. And we want to live holy lives according to it, just as God through the prophet Ezekiel was calling his people to live holy lives according to it. And if we move on in Ezekiel chapter 36, verse 22, Therefore say to the house of Israel, God says, Thus says the Lord God, again, a prophetic preface. You know you're reading the prophets when you see this kind of preface to um, uh, verses of Scripture. Let's move ahead a little bit in this 36th chapter of Ezekiel to verse 25, uh, because this is an extraordinary passage. It's a passage that's often overlooked. Um, but let's read this a little bit and then see what we think. So verse 25. I will sprinkle clean water on you, and you shall be clean from all your uncleanness, and from all your idols I will cleanse you. And I will give you a new heart and a new spirit I will put within you. And I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. Verse 27. And I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and be careful to obey my rules. You shall dwell in the land that I give to your fathers, and you shall be my people, and I will be your God. And I will deliver you from all your uncleanness. This is baptismal language. Again, think of when you're looking at a portrait. There's a foreground and a background, right? One picture. 
So we have one word from God here through the prophet Ezekiel. We have in the foreground um, God calling his people to repent and, and cleansing, uh, perhaps through uh, ritual washings that, that would have been part of the law back then. Uh, but in the background, in the culmination of Jesus' death and resurrection for us, for you, we have holy baptism. And this is baptismal language in the prophet Ezekiel. Um, he doesn't speak specifically of baptism, but we can see images of baptism uh, foreshadowed right here for us in Ezekiel. Um, uh, for we, we know we can read in, in uh, Peter and we can read in St. Paul in Romans, um, all of these things about how baptism uh, washes us clean. Um, how we will walk in the ways of God um, as his people and he will be our God. Um, death and resurrection, Romans chapter 6. Um, this is baptismal language foreshadowed here in the prophecy of Ezekiel. Um, and then moving ahead in verse 33, again, prophetic language here. Thus says the Lord God, Ezekiel says, thus says the Lord God, on the day, verse 33, on the day that I cleanse you from all your iniquities, I will uh, cause the cities to be inhabited and the waste places shall be rebuilt. Um, so cleansing from iniquities. Well, baptism cleanses us from all sin, right? Because it is, an, it is a, a giving of the blood of Christ where we are washed in the blood of the Lamb and we are made whole and clean uh, in Him. Uh, because Christ has accomplished all that is necessary for our salvation and is given to us in baptism and apprehended by faith. Uh, faith alone, I might add, is a Lutheran, right? <laughs> uh, yeah, so let's look to verse 37 now. And this is a famous uh, chapter, chapter 37. Um, it's extraordinary because um, it's, uh, there's, uh, the imagery of it is powerful. Um, and... I won't read it to you. I, I recommend, of course, you do, you do read it, but um, you probably know it well. But let's look at this, uh, chapter 37. So it begins this way, The hand of the Lord was upon me, and he brought me out in the Spirit of the Lord and set me down. Um, so the hand of the Lord was upon me. So, all right, um, we have this imagery of the prophet will be, will be seeing something and conveying something to God's people. Uh, we here we have an appearance of the Holy Spirit uh, working through the Word. Uh, he brought me out in the Spirit of the Lord and brought me in the middle of the valley. Um, and we learn here through metaphorical language. Uh, you have words pointing to one thing that are pointing to another. So we see here the power of God's Word, right? The creative power of God's word. So we think of Genesis, the beginning of the Bible. God speaks and stuff happens. Things are created. But also the, the regenerative and redemptive word of God. Because what does this do? This, this passage here from 37, Ezekiel 37, points to what? Resurrection, right? The redemptive power of God to give new birth, to give new and everlasting life, victory over death in Christ. Um, we see here uh, uh, where a connection to St. Paul in Romans where he says the gospel is the power of salvation for all. And we know later on in Romans, uh, chapter 10, I believe it is, where uh, we learn that faith comes by hearing. Right? And, and so the word of God comes to us in law and gospel. Uh, but specifically the gospel and the power of the Holy Spirit brings us to new life, right? redeems us and comes to us as a promise, just as we heard in Ezekiel before, um, where God says, I am for you. Uh, the gospel says, Christ is for you. In his death and resurrection, he has redeemed you. He has forgiven you all your sins. He has defeated death for you. Your death is defeated. Um, that's gospel stuff. And we see this in, in 37, that death has no claim over you who have died and risen with Christ in what? Holy baptism. There it is. Um, if we go on a little bit here in chapter 37, uh, let's go to verse 24. 
Uh, my servant David shall be king over them, and they shall all have one shepherd. Well, in 2 Samuel chapter 7, uh, we learn that the line of King David will go on forever. King David unified all of God's people, and we hear of this one singular shepherd uh, who will be over God's people. Well, who is that? The answer is Jesus Christ. Christ, who is in the line of King David, the root of Jesse, um, who... Uh, is alive today and that line goes on forever he sits at the right hand of the father and will come in glory to judge the living and the dead this is our creed this is our confession of faith um, the one shepherd rules over his church and let me just finish with this uh, the gates of hell shall not prevail against the church this is the body of christ uh, death couldn't contain him or hold him uh, and as the body of christ as his church um, nothing shall prevail against us, for indeed we are the body of Christ, redeemed by his blood, uh, and he is alive today, and he watches over us, and he has not abandoned us. Remember what he says at the end of St. Matthew's Gospel, lo, I am with you to the end of the age, and indeed he is, in his preached word, in his wonderful and blessed sacraments of holy baptism, holy absolution, and the Lord's Supper. He comes to us still, speaks to us his good news of forgiveness, life, and salvation. And his Holy Spirit is at work in his church. So don't be afraid, dear Christians. Uh, we find ourselves in this uh, difficult time. Uh, do not be afraid. He is with us, and he promises to be so to the end of the age. And his word is still active. His Holy Spirit is working through that word uh, to bring us to new and everlasting life uh, with Christ at the center of that forever. So there it is. That's our Bible study this week. Thanks for joining us. God bless you and keep you, dear Salem Church and dear friends who have watched. God bless you in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm.